Welcome everybody to this semester's deep learning lecture. As you can see, I'm not in the lecture hall, as many as of you. I am in my home office and we have to work from home in order to stop the current pandemic. We're the only ones who matter, the only ones in this world. And everything they've taken from us, we're going to take back and more. Therefore, I decided to record these lectures and then also put them available onto the internet such that everybody can download them freely. You will see that we did a couple of changes to this format. First of all, we reduced the length of the lectures. We no longer go for 90 minutes in a row. Instead, we decided to reduce the length into smaller parts such that you can watch them in 15 to 30 minutes in one go, then stop, and then continue to the next lecture. This means that we had to introduce a couple of changes. Of course, as every semester, we also updated all of the contents such that we really present the state of the art that is up to date to current research. Recursive self-improvement, um, that is really the pinnacle of that, where you uh, then not only learn uh, how to improve on that problem and on that, but you also improve the way the machine improves and you also improve the way it improves the way it improves itself. And that was my 1987 diploma thesis, which was all about that. This first lecture will be about the introduction into deep learning. We will deal with a broad variety of topics in this lecture. First and foremost, of course, deep learning, and we summarized some of the buzzwords that you may have already heard. We'll cover topics from supervised to unsupervised learning. Of course, we'll talk about neural networks, feature representation and feature learning, big data, artificial intelligence, machine learning, representation learning, but also different tasks such as classification, segmentation, regression, and generation. We are standing on the shoulders of the giants who, in the past, um, simplified the problem of problem solving so much that now we have a chance to do the final step. Now let's have a short look at the outline. So first we'll start with a motivation, why we are interested in deep learning. We see that we have seen tremendous progress over the last couple of years. So it will be very interesting to look into some applications and some breakthroughs that have been done. Then. In the next videos, we want to talk about machine learning and pattern recognition and how they are related to deep learning. And of course, in the first set of lectures, we also want to start from the very basics. We will talk about the perceptron. And um, yeah, we also have to talk about a couple of organizational methods, uh, matters that you will see in video number five. So let's look into the motivation and what are the interesting things that are happening right now. First and foremost, I want to show you this little graph about uh, the stock market value of NVIDIA shares. And you can see here that over the last couple of years, in particular since 2016, the market value has been going up very, very much. So one reason why this has been tremendously increasing is that approximately in 2012, uh, the deep learning uh, discovery started and they really took off approximately in 2016. So you can see that many people needed additional compute hardware. NVIDIA is manufacturing general purpose graphics processing units that allow arbitrary computation on their boards. In contrast to traditional hardware that doubles the compute capabilities within every two years, graphics boards ca uh, double their compute power within approximately 14 to 16 months which means that they have a quite extraordinary amount of compute power. This enables us to train really deep networks and the state-of-the-art machine learning approaches. I'm, I'm optimistic about what can happen just with more computation and more data. You can see that there's a considerable dip, uh, approximately around 2019, the end of 2018. And you can see that it's not only deep learning that is driving the market share value of NVIDIA so much, there's also another uh, very interesting thing happening at the same time, and that is uh, Bitcoin mining. And the Bitcoin value really decreased in, uh, at this period of time. Also, the NVIDIA value uh, went down. So it's uh, partially also associated to the Bitcoin. 
but you can see that the value is going up again because there's a huge demand in compute power in deep learning. Now, what are the interesting applications that we can aim at? So the big bang of deep learning was done with the so-called ImageNet challenge. So this is a really huge data set, and this huge data set has approximately uh, 14 million images labeled into approximately uh, uh, 20,000 synonym sets. So this ImageNet large-scale visual recognition challenge is using approximately 1,000 classes. Before the ImageNet challenge, classifying into 1,000 classes was essentially deemed completely impossible. But uh, the images that are used here, they have been downloaded from the internet and they have a single label per image. So this is a really huge database that allows us to assign categories, large numbers of categories, into individual images. Now in 2012, there was a breakthrough um, with, the, uh, with the AlexNet network and AlexNet really halved the error rate. So if we look at the different error rates that we have obtained uh, over the scope of the ImageNet challenge, you can see that we started off with uh, error rates about 25% uh, regarding the top five error. So in 2011, 25%, the years before that, we were approximately in that ballpark, and you could see a stalling over the last couple of years. Well, in 2012, the first convolutional neural network, CNN here, was introduced, and the CNN almost halved the error rate. Now, that was quite a big surprise, because nobody else could do it at that time. And you can see that not only in 2012 there has been progress, but in 2013 and so on, the error rates more and more decreased until we essentially reached a level uh, where they are approximately in the same range as humans. The humans are a low bar to exceed. So with residual networks, there was the first results where people have been claiming that they have been superhuman performance. So is it really superhuman performance? Well, not so many humans uh, have really evaluated the entire test set. So you could actually say that superhuman performance should be the super Carpathian performance because he actually went through the entire test data set. Now, is there a problem? Well, yes, there are a couple of problems with ImageNet. Well, uh, the above, the top row, is probably uh, rather easy cases. Uh, but if you look at the bottom row, there's a couple of really difficult ones as well. So uh, where you have uh, only parts of the image shown, or in particular, if you look at the cherry that also shows a dog, uh, it's very hard to differentiate those images. And of course, this is a problem if you only have a single label per image. Maybe a single label is just not enough to describe an entire image. Machines don't really have common sense now, so they don't understand that bottles contain water and that people drink water to quench their thirst and that they don't want to dehydrate. They don't know these basic facts about human beings. And I think that that's a rate limiting step for many things. However, all of these things are being used in industry right now. There's a huge number of deep learning users ranging from Google, um, Apple, IBM, DeepMind, but also many other companies are starting here. So you can see the Netflix challenge has been solved partially with deep learning. It was a $1 million challenge uh, actually to build a recommendation system that will recommend movies that you actually like. And you can see that healthcare is going in there, uh, Siemens and GE, uh, but also car manufacturers uh, such as Daimler and um, many other car manufacturers are going there because there's this huge trend towards autonomous driving. I mean, an autonomous car is arguably worth five to 10 times more than a, not, a car which is not autonomous. So let's look at a couple of really nice breakthroughs. So uh, for example, um, people have been uh, trying to beat humans in various games. And we already know since uh, 1997 um, that we can beat humans. Uh, so 1997, uh, IBM built Deep Blue, and Deep Blue was able to beat Garry Kasparov, who, was the, uh, who is a world champion in chess. I, I mean, I played Kasparov because we both gave lectures as
same event and he was playing 30 people. I forgot to mention that. Not only did he crush me, but he crushed, you know, 29 other people at the same time. But solving chess is uh, a little easier because it's not so complex. Yeah? There's only a number of limited moves that you can go. And the way how, you, how they actually solve the game is that they had a dictionary of starting moves. Then they essentially did a brute force search over the entire game in the mid part of the game. And towards the end of the game, again, they were using a dictionary. I actually beat the, or played the predecessor to Deep Blue. Um, Deep Thought, I believe it was called, um, and that too crushed me. Now Go is a much harder challenge because in every move of the game, you can place a stone on every part um, of the board. Meaning that if you really want to do exhaustive search and look for all the different opportunities that you have in the games only after a couple of moves, the actual number of moves is growing at a high exponential rate, which means that there's large branching factor and it's um, at with present compute power, it's not able to brute force the entire game. However, in 2016, uh, AlphaGo, um, a system created by DeepMind, uh, really beat uh, a professional Go player, so a world-class Go player. In 2017, AlphaGo Zero even surpassed every human in Go by self-play. Then, shortly later, AlphaZero generalizes to a number of other board games. They even managed to go towards even other games that are not like the typical board games. Uh, in Alpha Star, they beat professional StarCraft players. So it's really a very interesting technology to look at. In Google Deep Dream, there was the attempt to understand the inner workings of the network. And they were interested in what the uh, network dreams about when they present images. So the idea was to show some arbitrary input images or noises input. And then instead of adjusting the network parameters, they tweaked the, the input towards high activations of the network. And this creates, depending on where you're looking at, very interesting images. So you can create very impressionistic images, as shown here on the right-hand side with this input and uh, the improvement by the network. Or you can even put in things like blue sky images and then tweak towards neurons. And then you can see that there are all kinds of things suddenly emerging in the sky. And if you look very closely, you can see that there's new animals showing up, like the admiral dog, the pig snail, the camel bird, or the dogfish. So what else is interesting? Well. There's also real-time object detection that became possible with approaches like YOLO, you only look once, or YOLO 9000, or YOLO version 3. And they simultaneously detect bounding boxes and classify them very, very quickly. And uh, this runs in real time, and it's not just working on individual scenes or images like ImageNet, where you only have essentially one object per image, but it runs on completely cluttered scenes, and you can even see that these detectors work on unseen input uh, like movie scenes. Now you may say, these are very interesting examples, but well, are we using this in every day, or is it just research, and are there fancy videos being produced? Does it really work? Well, you may have seen that Siri, the speech recognition interface, has been improved tremendously, also with deep learning techniques. Siri speech recognition is now in the range where it um, recognizes approximately 99.7% of all the spoken words. Uh, so in 100 words, there's less than one word that is being misrecognized. And you can see Siri is being used. Many people use it in their phone. They use it to dictate. And it works. It works in, in various environments, also in environments on the road, when you're outside of your house, when there's background noises, and Siri still works. Siri, what time is it? It's time for you to get a boyfriend or you will turn into a lonely cat lady. Siri, call boyfriend. Which one, Joe? Thomas, Charlie, Michael, or Pat? Oh. There's also very interesting uh, stuff that is being deployed right now by Amazon. You can see that there is this uh, Amazon Dot that many people now have in their home where they can remote control different things, they can order, and typically it works very well. But of course, users that have a rather strong accent 
still experience trouble. Alexa, play Something's Cooking in My Kitchen by Dana on my Spotify. I can't find Something's Cooking in My Kitchen by Dana on Spotify. It's no f Dana. Cow. Now, I guess many of you also have been using Google Translate, which is a very nice translation tool that has been improved uh, quite a bit over the past two years, maybe two years ago. They really improved in performance, and this is because they switched to a general deep learning approach where they are now not only learning on individual pairs of languages, but they use all languages at the same time for training deep translation software. And this is very nice. If you look into Google Translate today, a lot of the things uh, can be translated automatically and typically it only requires a little bit of changes in the output such that you have a very good translation. So these are exciting high profile things that we have seen with deep learning. So next time on deep learning, I want to show you a couple of things that have been happening not just at Google and the very big players, but actually also here uh, in the small town of Alam, we have some exciting developments that I think are worth showing. So I hope you liked this video and see you next time on Deep Learning.